introduce Eddie Satterley. He's the chief evangelist in the office of the CTO at Splunk. Uh, prior to this, I believe Expedia, um, having done some enormous work there. Uh, and so, Eddie Satterley. Yeah, so like you said, chief evangelist for Splunk. Um, I was a Splunk customer before. I was also a puppet customer a few times for the past couple companies I worked with. So I uh, have some passion for both. And this is a great opportunity to kind of talk about some of the interesting things that Splunk is doing that I'm helping at Splunk to get Puppet more integrated into the stack for us. So quick agenda, the who I am part, so I got to talk about me for a second. And then, you know, what is Splunk for those people who may not know, which would kind of surprise me, but it happens occasionally. Um, some specific examples of the integration use cases, and then how do you get value, and then the, what else are we working on? So me, chief evangelist, office of CTO, I basically work with customers on big data, on integration space. Um, I'm involved with a number of uh, different open source projects. I liaise with a lot of community people, uh, building key integration points, key strategies, prototyping things. And then I get to hand it off to engineering and make them build it. Or sometimes like this one, I'll end up building the whole thing and then hand it off to them to make it supportable because I started off as a dev, but that was 20 some years ago and I'm not very good at it anymore. And they let me know frequently. So they'll take my code and make it pretty and make it supportable and then we'll release it. So the what is Splunk, just for the people who don't know, we ingest machine data of just about any type out there. If it's text-based, we suck it in, we put it in into our store, we index everything, we build the time series index. You can do searches, build dashboards, create lots of little fun apps. And there's 300 plus apps out there on Splunk Base today, most of which are contributed by community members uh, to extend the platform and add some intelligence on top of it. So the what we collect, these are my must do slides. Um, the architecture for Splunk is three tier architecture. The forwarders are deployed to the end state boxes. The mid tier, which is for indexing, which stores all the data, indexes it all in a load balanced, auto load balanced fashion. Then the search head, which is the UI that people log into and issue queries through our search language to go out and retrieve things. So it's important to understand this part for the first piece of what I'm gonna talk about. So what the real focus for Splunk is across here. We look at app management, IT ops, security, compliance, web intelligence, business analytics. We have a number of SDKs and developer frameworks for Java, JavaScript, PHP, um, Python. So you can extend the platform. Now let's talk a little bit first. So the kind of there's three pieces to what uh, I'm going to work on and going to get released for the integration. The first one is just to take some stuff that's been out there for quite a long time on Puppet Forge and make it a little more robust and able to handle the whole stack. So if you've used it to deploy Splunk, it's very good at deploying the forwarders. The rest of the architecture doesn't really exist. Uh, there's one module out there that was created by somebody that uh, works with a certain version but doesn't work with others. So I'm going to take that and check in a Forge module that will actually let you deploy an entire Splunk framework, whether it's you know whatever stack you're deploying to. We'll let you put in all three tiers of the architecture, go ahead and connect them all, create all your authentication points, all the distributed search points between them all, get it configured up and running all out of one single puppet uh, process. So that's number one. That already existed, like I said, but it was in a limited fashion. It'll be extended to do everything. So you can deploy 100% of Splunk, which covers literally this entire architecture. Um, even down to the fact that we can set up the authentication on the search heads and everything else. This requires the here integration, so now I, I'm finally gonna get it built. So that's part one. Part two, which is what I'm gonna talk about now, is the security and appliance. So Splunk has got a new uh, focus area. We created a practice within Splunk to really focus on extending our security and compliance offerings above the couple of Splunk apps that are out there today to something that moves to the next level, lets you react to threats, lets you actually make changes to the environment, and enforce configuration. So to do that, we're working with Puppet to basically build that integration between them so that you can use Splunk's ability to do file integrity monitoring, you can do it to um, monitor installed packages, monitor what's going on on the box at any given time and react within seconds. So Puppet's awesome at enforcing configuration, but it 
the detection piece is what Splunk's really awesome at, so let's marry the two and make it work together. So there's a couple of workflow examples. This is one of them. This actually comes from a real-life customer conversation that, that I had recently. Guy gets woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning, sysadmin. App owner calls him, says, hey, I got to do this. I need to be able to sudo to root. Guy quickly VPNs in, logs in, VI the sudoers file, add John to the list, give him all root. He logs out, tells John he's good to go. John tries to log in. It doesn't work. John calls him back and says, it still doesn't work. I can't get in. Well, the reason he can't get in is because Splunk has immediately detected there's a change to a protected file with its fem, which is called fschange in Splunk. The file has been changed. It's been modified. It's a protected file. It immediately flags it as a protected file. The automated alert calls pu the puppet agent, resets it, tells it quickly, reset this file back to where it was, put the sudoers file back to the gold configuration that's acceptable, so it's immediately enforced, and he's locked out again. Also, an alert goes to the security operations team. So in the meantime, the call's made back to the admin. He says, I still can't log in. Admin logs in again, says, well, maybe I did a Q bang instead of a WQ bang when I was in VI. Maybe I forgot to save my change. So he tries it again, does it again, puts him back in the sudoers file, writes it again, still logged into the box, calls the guy back and says, hey, you're good to go. Go ahead and log in and make your change. Guy tries to log in, it doesn't work. So he immediately says, this is crazy. Moors the file, finds out, absolutely, he's not in the sudoers file. I don't know what's going on. Comes into office and says, what the hell's happening? I'm trying to make this change. This isn't working. Something's broken. Well, it's not broken. It's actually being enforced by Puppet on those systems. So as soon as he makes the change, the change gets put back. That's one very powerful use case and uh, helps substantially with PCI compliance, SOX compliance, the things that you have to be able to report on a dashboard to and make sure that you're being enforced in a way that makes sense. So another interesting uh, use case, again, real life customer experience. A uh, system owner, guy who's a release manager, logs into a box, installs Tomcat 5, because he knows Tomcat 5 well and loves version 5 of Tomcat. Splunk receives, again, a FIM um, alert so that Tomcat 5 is an installed package by the RPM lookup. Quickly goes out and looks against the vulnerability database, in this case, it lives in Cassandra. Says, this is a major issue. The list of vulnerabilities for Tomcat 5 is longer than my arm, so we probably shouldn't have that deployed on a production server. Fires an alert. Alert, again, goes to Puppet. Puppet uninstalls. Tomcat v5 is a package enforces a config that exists out there. So another situation where immediately there's an issue that could have really bit somebody. Um, I think the cross-site scripting list alone for v5 is about 70 entries. So just to look at the number of vulnerabilities is pretty scary. So why? So this is an example from real life, something, again, that I experienced personally. Um, we went through a PCI audit with a company that had to be PCI compliant. The Linux admin, who's really an engineer, um, is, sits in a room for two days with the PCI auditor, logs into several hundred boxes as a sampling across all of the different layers of the architecture that you have, because you got to verify middleware, you got to verify database, you got to verify all the Apache front end servers goes and logs into a sample of them, looks at config files, goes into the Etsy security directory, verifies files, spends his whole day with, hooked up to a, a projector showing the PCI auditor that we're good to go. Deploy Splunk, deploy Puppet, get all the config enforcement done. The following year, the guy comes out, same PCI auditor, luckily enough. QSA comes in and says, okay, we're gonna go through this again. They schedules two days of the, my engineer's time. The engineer sets down, says, okay, here, I'm gonna log into Splunk. Here's all of our systems. Here's all the config files. Here's all the stuff that's being monitored by FEM. Here's the list of protected files. Oh, here we go. We're gonna log into the Puppet Master, and I'm gonna show you exactly how all this works. And then quickly logs into a sampling of four servers, logs into each of them, makes a change to the sudoers file. Within 15 seconds, does a more on the file, sees that it's back to where it used to be. Changes four or five other files that are in the FEM protected directories. Uh, delete something from var log uh, just to prove that it works on these boxes. The auditor says, this is great, lets him go. 45 minutes into the day, the guy goes back to his real job, 
and doesn't waste the rest of the time. Then the side story to this is, but the Windows admin got to spend three days logging into all the systems and proving that it still worked because the Windows guys did not use Puppet. Um, all the issues were detected, but you can't do anything about it when you don't have an enforcement, and SCCM didn't work. So the, the V5 Tomcat example, again, that's something that had been, if it had been flagged as a risk, someone would have done that. Someone could have easily lost their job. Uh, there was no approved window for it. It shouldn't have been installed anyway, and they installed a version that is clearly outside the gold build, is not in the repo, and is not allowed to be installed. So that could have been a loss of job that just got cleared up in the back end. Somebody got a nasty note from security later on because they were, of course, alerted. But at least he still worked there when it was over. Um, another one, IT, IP tables firewall. So I, I, I hate to use these terms, but this comes from a quote from a customer. They had a lazy sysadmin who wanted to be able to troubleshoot from home, so he opens up a VPN connection point to point in the IP tables, which is handing their edge firewall capability so he can, from home, log in without having to go through all the trouble of pulling that little dongle out of his pocket and typing in his code. Yeah, so this, this has been going on immediately. There's an integration created on the Puppet side to enforce the IP tables files and config files. It gets fixed, immediately detected, flagged as an issue and a risk. The guy literally got fired. They, as soon as they figured out who did it, they went in and fired the admin on the spot. This was a company that had substantial online presence and large revenue running through these IP tables firewalls, and the guy opened a connection into his house. So I know no one here would do that, but if someone did, it would have immediately been detected, detected and fixed. So I was hoping to actually get at least the module done before I got here or get the dashboard done. I didn't get any of that done because I've been doing the traveling circuit of talking at conferences for the last four months. But I'm going to get these checked in, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, if not January, February of next year, for all the integration pieces. The kind of key takeaways for the integration is that the Forge module will be there for deployment. The Splunk Base app will be out there, not only to take advantage of all the logs that come from Puppet, which of course you can get from your Puppet dashboard if you want to, but also to tie that data to stuff that lives in the system, lives inside the apps within Splunk. So Splunk has the logs for everything running on those boxes, whether it's a middleware system, whether it's a Apache log, whether it's literally the network devices that are connecting things together. You would be able to, within one dashboard, drill in, look at what's coming from Puppet, what the config files are that are being ingested, what the force kind of gold state of the system should be, and exactly what's going on in the box at any given time. So you could quickly correlate a even mistake that was happened by deployment all the way back to a specific impact to a system at the end. Also, Splunk's FIM documentation is not very good, so that's being improved as part of our uh, enhanced security work that we're doing now and building that whole security practice out. As we do that, we're gonna write a white paper early next year around our FIM capabilities and around Puppet's ability to enforce compliance uh, that'll document how all this stuff is gonna work and exactly how the Splunk app can detect a change and use Puppet to enforce configurations back to a state. Um, also in the case of what was done before, um, there was a lookup to uh, CMDB that was created that would let you go out and figure out what the box was. So the intention in the first quarter of next year is to keep the CMDB lookups from a database if someone happens to want to use those, but also be able to go and do a lookup from the Puppet DB find out what the configuration should be on the box and be able to publish that as well in a search in the UI from Splunk. So when you search for the host, you can find out, if you point it to the correct source type, you'd be able to find out exactly what in PuppetDB is supposed to be for this particular server. So, and again, like I talked about before, extending the integration from just being able to install forwarders, which is not particularly useful, uh, to being able to this deploy the entire 5.0 cluster Splunk's 5.0 versions in beta now is going to be out publicly um, soon. Now that we're a public company, I can't give dates. But it's going to release soon. Uh, and when it does, you'll be able to do full deployments of all the tiers from Puppet with the Puppet Forge modules, as well as do all the visualizations in the Splunk Base app. So I will actually open things up to questions. I got mics down the middle, so step up to a mic if you have a question. Um, 
esoderly at splunk.com or big data at splunk.com also gets me. As far as if you want to reach out to me, give me ideas on things you want to see, I'm happy to extend all the functionality to make it work um, over time. So if there's things you want to see, external lookups you want to do, let me know and we'll get it built. Yeah, hi. This uh, new file integrity monitor, is it um, something that you're using, you're looking at log files for? Is it some new tripwire-like functionality that you guys are adding on? No, it's actually been in the product since version 3. Um, it was called FS Change, which is a, just a file system change, which we really built into the product originally to be able to detect if log files that we were looking at had been changed or modified. But as more recently with our professional services organization has used it with, since version 4 when it got a little more stable, has used it to be able to do true file integrity monitoring for a number of pretty large PCI customers, including where I used to work. Um, so that was about... I think it was a little over 1,100 files uh, across about 8,000 systems that were in the PCI domain that we were doing enforcement on. So the functionality has been there. It just never was really meant to do this. Uh, when it was built, it's just we're extending it to make it work, and it works considerably better even in 5. It's more optimized. Great. Thanks. And you're, so you're doing something similar with the package database on the system? or? Yeah. So we're actually we're actually indexing the values that live in there and holding it in an index within Splunk so that we can look up and see if anything changes in the index to see what packages are there, and then doing an external lookup to a vulnerability NoSQL store. In my case, I built it in Cassandra. I know we have a couple customers that have it in Mongo. Uh, there's plenty of ways you could do it as a KV store, so it's easy to look up and compare against. Uh, are you considering uh, making this some, somewhat extendable? So, like, if I have my own... I don't know, my, my own source of truth database, can I like pull data from there and tell Splunk to keep an eye on this thing? or Anything that has a KV store, uh, it, if it's a relational database, it's a little harder because we'd have to build custom lookups. So that's a little more challenging. But if it's in a KV store style, NoSQL type or document store, JSON, anything Django. that we can do it. Sure. All right. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. No problem.